Since the Idi Amin regime in the 1970s, followed by civil war in the 1990s, Uganda's wildlife has suffered huge declines. In the country's largest park, Queen Elizabeth, elephant, hippo and giraffe populations are a fraction of their former size, and only 140 lions remain. In the southern Ashasha area, only two dozen. While human populations surge and cattle provide status and revenue, now a new blight on the land is accelerating the conflict between farmers and hungry lions in the park. There is no more iconic and culturally significant animal than the lion. But lions are struggling, and conflict with people has seen their numbers decline by 30% in the last few years. Here in Uganda, an invasive and inedible species of plant growing in the communal grazing lands surrounding the national parks has forced farmers to move their cattle inside the park boundaries. Occasionally, lions eat the cows, and in revenge, Lions are killed by the farmers. So I've joined forces with a team of researchers who are trying to resolve this conflict by putting GPS collars on members of one of the most unique populations of lions anywhere in Africa, the tree climbing lions of Ishashin. In order to find the small population of lions in this vast area, I'm heading south across the park to meet with biologist Andy Plumtree and his team. Where possible, They'll replace worn-out collars and use the transmitter's signal to locate the pride. They use this uh, radio system to basically pick up the lion collars. We have two lions that are down here that have got collars on. We have got to find a suitable candidate for collaring, and we begin by following the faint signal of the previously collared female. Then, something catches my eye. We've come across these fantastic tracks, which are Relatively fresh, but it would have been sometime yesterday. And heading along this way, they start on the far side of the road and then they cross and head that way. And then they've gone down into the ravine off in that direction. Finding a, one of 24 lions in a massive national park is pretty well, yeah, I mean, very this, difficult. This area is 450 square kilometers. It's a bunch. As the collared lion in the ravine is known to have cubs and is thus a risky candidate, the next option is to return to one of the large fig trees where the Ashasha lions often congregate. We were looking for a female lion of maybe about six years old, there or thereabouts, and we found one. Would this one be a candidate for putting a radio collar on? Yeah, um, she's an adult female, or pretty much adult. She's just going from sort of adult to adult, and um, we're looking for a female that's likely to stay in the pride and not move elsewhere. So she would be a prime candidate, because she's going to probably live several years, and the colour will last about three years, so... The females live 10 to 15 years out in the wild? Yeah, about that. Andy has a number of theories about why these lions climb trees. Escape from the heat, flies, but perhaps most importantly, Ishasha has an unusual number of accessible fig trees with large branches, as opposed to thorny acacia trees found elsewhere in Africa. Lions just find them comfortable. What we want to do with the colouring is set up something called experiential tourism, which is basically tourists will pay extra to go out in a special vehicle to get up close to the lions. Some of that proceeds of what they pay will go and support community projects and potentially compensation for livestock loss as well. So we would have to wait for her to come down to the ground before trying to dart her, presumably? Yeah, yeah, but there's no way we'd dart her in the tree. With a great candidate picked out, we have to wait till the next day for the arrival of the regional vet. We head out across the park at dawn the next day in search of our lioness. In the late 1960s, Queen Elizabeth National Park had the largest biomass, or animals by weight, in the world. Today, despite appearances, it's a small fraction of that. We find Jane, the lioness from the tree, with a hunting partner, a younger female. The veterinary team prepares the tranquilizer. Margaret is our vet, who's going to be tranquilizing the lion. 
and they're currently just going through the rather complex maths to figure out exactly what dose they need to give a lion of a certain size. Of course, the reason we're doing this is to affix a transmitter collar with GPS around her neck, which every eight hours will be beaming a signal of exactly where she is so that Andy and the rest of his team can monitor the movements of the pride around this part of Queen Elizabeth National Park, better inform the local communities of where the lions are moving so they can alter where they move their livestock as well. It's a critical part of the conservation of this highly endangered species here in Uganda. Heading towards the lion now. It's just down there. You can see the lion's head sticking up just to the right of the acacia tree. So we're moving around to about 20 meters away. Margaret has a clear shot. The lion just yawned. Massive teeth. There's two, and we're aiming for the one on the right, which is slightly older. It, it has to get out. It has to get it up. So the lioness is lying down. It can easily deflate. We just need her to sit up, and then Margaret will be able to get the dart straight into the muscular part of her thigh, hopefully. minutes and then she should, should be fully under. I think she's getting drowsy. The head yeah. is down. Yeah, her head down. Yeah. So the head has gone down, so we'll That's... give her maybe another minute. Using the truck, we have to isolate the lion to be collared, as the younger one may rush in to defend her downed partner. Just need to keep an eye where she went. Here's the stick, Margaret. One of these Yeah. Now we have to see if the downed lion is really sedated. Andy's just going to poke her to make sure she doesn't respond. She's definitely asleep. Just when we thought it was safe to step out, the lioness shows she's still full of life. We're attempting to sedate and put a GPS collar on an endangered lion in Uganda's Queen Elizabeth Park. So we have this vehicle just to make sure that the other lioness stays away. So we chased her out that way, but she banked round, and the last thing we want is her coming back. So we've got some of the park rangers just going that way to make sure that she stays away so we can do everything with this lioness in total safety. It's wise to be cautious, since the second lion could sprint in defensively in seconds. Margaret's making sure that the cat can't swallow its tongue. The tongue's out, so she can't possibly choke on it, so she's not going to have any problems while she's under the anaesthetic. So, big, healthy female. Mustafa, can you get for me the drug boxes, please? Just making sure that the collar can't come off. It's, it's going to feel quite unusual to her, so she'll try and force it off in the first few days until she gets used to it. And while we're doing this, Margaret's going to perform a range of other basic health checks, blood tests, that type of thing. Temperature, take a blood sample, general assessment of condition. Even ticks are removed to ensure the good health of the lioness. Rangers continue to stand guard, alert to the possibility of a lion charge.
Then we have a look at this paw. Absolutely enormous. Essentially the size of my hand. And like most cats, they have retractable claws. Like these. So they tend to keep them up, kept within the rest of the paw. But when they're attacking, they evert those claws and then they're put into action. It's incredibly sharp, about an inch long. So we've just given her a bit of iodine because she's got a wound inside here. And um, iodine's an incredibly good disinfectant. It kills basically everything. She's so missing a couple of incisors. Oh. Oh. Just, just broken off a couple of incisors. <coughs> Nothing serious. <laughs> Otherwise, dentition looks really healthy. It seems the lioness is beginning to wake, while guards remain alert for the other one. The park guards been watching where the other lioness is and just moving to make sure that they stay between us and the lioness so it doesn't come here and cause us any problems. All right, so now we have to get back into the car. Margaret's administering the reversal agent and that will take effect pretty quickly. And then we monitor the lioness. That was incredibly quick, incredibly efficient. It's been 26 minutes precisely. Collar is on. Job done. Fantastic. <laughs> Margaret has administered the reverse agent, and then we just have to monitor for a few minutes to make sure she fully regains her coordination. And then, well, the sun's already gone down. It's starting to get dark. She'll be off out on the hunt. But there's a problem. The anaesthetic is taking much longer than expected to wear off, even after the reverse agent was injected. We've got a storm brewing. Hopefully she'll wake up before that hits us. Can we check on her? Okay, you want me to drive up? Yeah. Please. Margaret wants to examine the lion for vital signs, clues to her alertness. Like people, individual lions respond in different ways to anaesthetic, and her full revival could take hours. But with a thunderstorm brewing, the timing could not be worse. Margaret tests for any signs of revival. Exactly 20 minutes since the reverse laser was put in. She's just sleeping like a baby. She's breathing at a really good rate, just deep and steady, constant rate of breathing. So we know she's fine, but you pressed on that pressure point at the end of the tower, she didn't even budge an inch. Margaret would like to give a bit of a top-up of reversal, just to try and speed the process up. We can't leave her until she's up and, and off and running again, because hyenas could come in and, and kill her, or she could be hurt in some other way. Margaret makes sure the lion is not awake before stepping out to administer another dose of the revival agent. Finally, she comes around, looking healthy. She's fine. She's very relaxed. All the sleep have been out, and she's got a radio collar on. So we'll come back in the morning and find her, and just make sure she's doing as well as we hope she is. And she's totally calm now, anyway. Next, I head north to hear of big cat attacks and a very noxious weed that is affecting the future of the park and the remaining lions. Day, we follow the signal from the new collar to check up on our lioness. So we've been looking for this radio collared lioness for three and a quarter hours, and it turns out we've been chasing a reflection of the radio signal, which Andy had predicted all along. And what she's done is head off into a ravine, so the signal was easily lost, and must be bouncing off various other things, sending us on a merry dance around the park. There she is. That was great to see the female that we collared last night, sitting 
and just relaxing underneath the tree. It's just gone midday, so it's the hottest part of the day, and she's quite rightly taken a bit of shade in order to rest and recuperate. She's not far from where we collared her, but she's bright and alert, and the collar seems to be well fitted, and she's not itching at it. So it seems to have been highly successful, which is fantastic. Heading back across the southern Ishasha region of the park, I come across a different kind of formidable creature. So although I'm here in the savannas of Uganda looking for what is largely regarded as one of the most dangerous animals in the whole world, the lion, in reality, <laughs> these things are almost as bad. So these are African army ants. The reputation that these have is absolutely fearsome. I've heard rumours of babies literally being carried out of their cots and off to be devoured over towards where the army ants have their nest. And I know for sure that whole grown animals that have been kept caged have been stripped of all their flesh, so there's absolutely nothing left simply overnight. In some parts of Africa, they're actually used as sutures. So if you have a, a wound, like a gash down your head, you can hold these soldiers up to the wound and they'll just clamp on. They'll <laughs> clamp onto anything that's in front of them. It's a bit of grass and it's nailed that. And they'll clamp on and they'll pin your wound so well together that it acts in exactly the same way as a stitch would. If you have a long wound, simply use half a dozen ants and then let your wound heal as it would after a visit to the doctor. My journey to understand the human-lion conflict takes me north. Some of the pastoralist communities live right on the edge of the park boundary itself. And it's these communities that are suffering the greatest loss of their livestock as a result of predation by the lions, but also these communities that are most heavily persecuting the lions in revenge. Raising cattle is part of the fabric of these communities, and I want to find out how these pastoralists are coping with lions in their midst. Even as an invasive plant, it's only making matters worse. Introduced as an ornamental plant by European settlers, the toxic Lantana camara has spread across the land. In effect, forcing farmers to seek safer grazing inside the national parks, exposing them to lions. These pillars mark the boundary of Queen Elizabeth National Park. And they're every 100 or 150 meters or so, more or less all the way around. But as you can see, there's essentially no difference between this side in the national park and that side in the communal grazing areas. And this is where the farmers are moving their cattle in. And they're moving in, coming into contact with the lions, and the lions are following them back out. And then the lions are actually taking the cattle, not only inside the park, but right next to the villages as well. When the lion come to attack this crowd, I have dogs. So when the dogs bark, they make noise, then I wake up. I just chase the, the lion with my dog. As I reach the, uh, the lion, just give it a kind, then it goes. When your cow is, is eaten by a lion, then it means you are not going to survive. There's an absolutely enormous number of cattle here, probably over a hundred head of cattle, and they'd all belong to one person. And it might not seem such a bad idea, but these cows, these spectacularly charismatic longhorn cattle, are highly non-productive. They do not produce good or much beef, and they do not produce much milk either. What would be a far better situation would be if they sold off these cows and replaced them with much more productive cows. Therefore, they need far less in order to get much more out of the same investment. I speak with Nelson Guma, who manages the park's wildlife, about the dilemma. How do you manage the conflict of, of lions and people? Because lions are taking livestock. How do you go about trying to reduce that, that possibility? There's no policy of compensation. So if the lions uh, eat your livestock, that is certainly not compensated. Now, we try to support the livelihood of these communities. When it is an injury, 
then we, we, we meet the, the, the medical costs. But we are trying to look at uh, initiatives that would help uh, communities to benefit. Maybe tourism would be one of them. This elder in the village told me they plan to put up a better lighting system in the village to keep lions out of the communities at night. For the time being, there may be an even easier solution. Eliminate the invasive plant. <laughs> Benjamin, part of the Wildlife Conservation Society team, is supporting local initiatives to remove the toxic lantana from traditional grazing areas around the park. How much of an issue is the lantana? It, does it cover a large area of a grazing land? Yeah, it was two thirds of their land was covered by lantana kama in this community, two thirds. At least now they are going at least less than that. With fewer plants deadly to grazing cattle, it's hoped that the locals will keep their herds outside of the park and away from the lions. When I head back south to Ashasha to resume the lion collaring, I come across a massive python with a nasty temper. Whoa. It's day four of our lion study in Uganda's Queen Elizabeth National Park. Heading out this morning, I get two surprises. First, we're stopped dead in our tracks by a herd of very territorial elephants. Next, there's news of a giant python sighting, which I have to check out. So it's just after dawn, and we're going to just spread out and try and find it, and then see what state it's in. And there's some birds alarm calling over there, which could be an indication but we'll have to see. But I'm going to check this area of brush first and just hope there's no lions. Local rangers said the python had just eaten a cob antelope and was crossing the road. It could be anywhere in this underbrush. A small hole there, too small for it to have got into. It looks like the guides have found a clue. So you can see path through the bush. If that was a mammal path, it would be flattened from the top as opposed to just underneath with this corridor left above it. Evidence of snakes. Well, I found it. <laughs> and from this angle, it looks enormous. So <laughs> now you get that kind of sense in your stomach of the butterfly starting and you just don't know what's gonna happen. Right, you can see where it's eaten. Tail here. Here is the head. It's big, so based on its head size, I would say it's probably around 11 to 12 feet. So what I'm gonna do is just try and encourage it out without actually having to manhandle it out. Then we can have a good look at it. And here it comes, hello. These guys are notoriously aggressive. Just maniac, lunatic, aggressive, that type of thing. But as well as that, they have just an incredible strike length. Here she comes. Oh. Whoa! I don't want to handle it too roughly because it's eaten and I don't want it to regurgitate its food. <clears throat> so ideally I can just kind of encourage it out so we can get a good look. There we go. Leave the cameraman alone. Oh, get that stick out of your mouth. There we go. Yeah, so its strike distance is to about a foot away from me at the moment. 
And it's probably best it stays that way, but I'll try and encourage her out if I can. They'll strike anywhere at the body. I know of people that have been bitten around the legs and even the torso by these. And with a, something like a cob, as soon as it's got it fixed, basically the cob's dead. And then once the cob has actually been asphyxiated, it will be swallowed head first. And it's amazing, you can actually see all of the different lumps of the cob's body. You can see where its head is, which is only about a meter back from the, the tip of the tail of the snake. It's swallowed it pretty quickly. Helps that they've got an enormous stomach. Well, it's an amazing encounter. I've been incredibly lucky to have seen her. And because she's so full, I don't want to stress her out any more than, than I already have, just by moving this around and getting a good glimpse of her. I'm just going to have to guess, based on her enormous size, that she is a pretty full-grown female, probably 20 years old, there or thereabouts. Probably has another 10 years' worth of picking off the cob around this national park in her. Excellent. We'll leave you alone. At the core of saving the lions of Ashasha is the need to stop villagers' revenge killings, which also affects animals such as hyenas and very rare vultures. So we're going to be actually doing a capture, mark, recapture program here, is that right? Yeah, what, what we've traditionally done is we've done a count once a year, and at this time of year, every year, see the maximum number of vultures you get at a, a kill. Um, and now what we're trying to do is actually capture some of those and do a proper capture mark recapture analysis to see how it compares to the counts we get at a, a killed cow. We're also, I suppose, hoping that some large mammals will come down to the kill as well. Well, there's a good chance lions will turn up at some point, maybe tonight, but um, I think we plan to leave some cameras out, so see if we can capture those. That would be great. But one, of the, one of the problems that the lions have is when they kill a cow like this, the, the owners of the cow get annoyed, not, not surprisingly. They'll lace them with poison, but what they poison can be anything, so it can be the, the lions or it can be hyenas that turn up or it's often the vultures. Do you know what number of lions have been poisoned in that way in this park? In the last 10 years, it's an estimated about 15 to 20 lions. That's shocking. Which out of 140 total, that's quite, quite a lot. That's horrendous. I remember you saying 50 vultures were poisoned at a single kill as well. Yes. That's diabolical when you've got... When you've only got 250. That's pretty poor. Going to all these carcasses, yeah. So Dr. Plumtree sets up a vulture count program using a locally butchered cow as bait to monitor the health of the vulture population. I'm setting up our remote cameras to film the vultures and any lions that show up. We wait several hours, but no groups of vultures appear to feed. Something else must have their attention. We decide to leave the carcass to see what shows up in the evening. It's Janet, the mother with cubs, wearing an old radio collar. About 20 minutes before the sun's about to go down, one of the collared lionesses has just come to the cow, which is pretty fantastic. And I just had time to set the camera traps up as well, so I should be getting some pretty amazing footage of her eating from the camera traps, which are right next to where the cow is. The reason I think this is important to observe this type of thing is because Lions really are predating quite a lot of cows in the area here in Ishasha, in the Queen Elizabeth National Park, but also all over Africa. One of the most concerning causes of fatality in lions is the poisoning of carcasses on purpose by local livestock owners. So a carcass like this will be laced with a form of insecticide and therefore anything that eats on it is going to die. And that includes lions, includes hyenas, jackals, vultures, and various other species, anything which touches it is going to be killed. It's totally indiscriminate, and it's a lamentable thing that people are doing this to wildlife. And they're doing it in retribution. And they're doing it in spite, I suppose, in spite because they don't like the fact that there are predators on the lands where they want to graze their cattle. But the national parks and the wildlife that lives inside the national parks in Africa and everywhere in the world are really the most valuable things that are still left on this earth. Not only in terms of revenue gained from ecotourism, the types of people that want to come and see these animals pay a lot of money for the privilege to do so, 
but also just in terms of intrinsic value. What is the world without its wild places and its wild animals? Then Jane, the lioness we collared, shows up to feed at the carcass. We leave the cameras, hoping some vultures might show up by morning. It's day five in Uganda's Queen Elizabeth Park, and rangers have just told us about an elephant killed by poachers nearby. A meal this big may have fed the vultures for a week and explain why none came to the cow carcass last night. It's incredibly sad. Elephants are hugely intelligent, have very complex social groups and tight family networks. Um, the loss of an individual like this would be keenly felt by all of its family members and members of the herd. Made even more tragic because it's simply so that some, some loser can have an ivory carving on his desk. I'd like to meet the man. Next, we head back to the cow carcass to see what our cameras might have captured not much left of it and there's just tiny tiny little bits of of the cow over here the skull's been picked clean we were here we were here 12 hours ago and, and there's nothing left on the skull now absolutely nothing jump down and there's the skull they've destroyed what was an entire cow and there's essentially just the parts that lions find unpalatable left <laughs> but from what the guys were saying, if hyenas had been here, they'd have eaten through the hooves as well. Right. There's nothing hyenas find unpalatable, more or less. They'd have smashed all the bones to pieces and, and eaten the hooves. At least it gives something for the vultures to come back to. The remote cameras fed no better than the Two. cow. Tooth puncture marks in the back. Would, li would lions, that the first thing she did was come and sniff the camera? But she didn't seem too worried about that. No. They've absolutely destroyed this. Yeah, well, the ch chip is intact, so that's all right. I've tried turning it on and the rest of it's destroyed. When we do manage to play the file on the card, we see the lion investigating the camera, then picking it up and walking off and finally killing the annoying beast with the blinking infrared eye. They've just destroyed them. I've never, never seen that before. Like, they've absolutely destroyed them. All, all three that we set up have been one smashed to pieces, smithereens, and the others are completely out of use. In the meantime, Andy's WCS team have located another lion, also wearing an old transmitter collar that needs replacing. What news? So they got a signal. The lion is still a fair way down that way, but we're going to get the darts all prepared here. OK. So we're all ready to go when we get there. Um, hopefully she'll still be out and not under a bush. There's quite a few obstacles when you're driving off track in Africa. Um, there's ditches, obviously. There's massive termite mounds, and some of them are concealed inside grass, and you don't know it until you nail into one. Yeah, yeah. you can see where the vultures are. So yeah. Vultures are a really good signal for us, but other animals in the park also use them as well. So hyenas and, and lions will monitor what the vultures are up to and then will head over there in the hope of finding a, a kill that they can scavenge from. Vultures taking off over there. We pass an animal boneyard, positive proof that lions are operating in the area. So she's definitely in the middle of the swamp. We've been circling all the way around the swamp and this signal's going right into the centre. We've just done a, a half circuit around it and the signal's been strongest right in the middle. So I think we're going to drive much closer again, just rule out a few of the bushes that are surrounding the swamp and see where she might have entered or where she might be exiting. The lioness could be anywhere in this tall grass and it's a short leap to the top of the vehicle. So the lioness was next to us by about a metre. She just went that way, so we're going to turn to the right. 
and hopefully then flush her out towards where Margaret the vet is. Now she seems to be in this bit of grass just in front of us to the right, and then between us and the bush. There she is, there she is. There she is. So now we just watch her. She's just gone back into the bush. Over there, or into the swamp right next to that bush. She so was supposed to, to go back, back off, but she's back in. Try and cut her off, but we got stuck. Um... She just came back round and back into the swamp again, about 40 metres away. So it's obviously very hot. What we're thinking the best thing to do is to leave her alone now to head off to another part of the park and then come back here at about three or four o'clock in the afternoon when it's cooling and that she'll be wanting to come out by herself anyway. And then we'll try and get her then in the afternoon. We return in the afternoon and find the lioness Daroka right away. Oh, there she is, she's straight in there. Her old collar is nearly falling off. Dr. Margaret and the veterinary team move in to tranquilize her. I saw it bounce out, and the lion's just picked the dart up. It's gone that way with it in her mouth. We'd have, we'd have to see the dart in order to be able to tell when the little plastic sleeve has gone down. So the lioness has the dart in her mouth. She's obviously identified that as being something that bit her, and she's keeping hold of it. She's laying down just over there. And she's moving. She's moving, that means probably didn't go in. Second time lucky. This dart has to hit the mark if we're going to help out this dwindling lion population. is in. It's in the back leg, exactly where it belongs. So 5.32 in the afternoon. The dart is definitely in. We got it. Fantastic. So it seems as though the lion's actually trying to figure out what it was that just bit her. They're not massively bright, as Andy has emphasised. They tend not to associate the sting with the car that was right next to them. She's currently kind of looking around. She hasn't taken the dart out of her leg yet. And I expect her to go down in the next couple of minutes. It's been a minute and a half since it went in. This is pretty amazing stuff. And it's made all the better knowing what an impact this work is actually doing on the conservation of lions here in Uganda and what an impact it's having on the ability of the communities around here to regulate their farming practices by knowing exactly where the lions are going. Daroka is moved out of the hot sun into a cooler, shaded area. So you can see where the dart went in on the leg there. And we all dab that with iodine just to make sure that no infection could possibly go in there. And I've already cut off the old colour, which I've put down there, which was uh, two or three years old. It was running out of efficacy anyway. And the new ones are simply much better and will last the next three years. So we had to be very careful to make sure that the collar wouldn't come off. Because she will play with it. It's something, even though she's had a collar on before, and this one's new, it'll feel different and she'll want to aggravate it or agitate it. 
As before, a complete health check is done. So, Margaret, Margaret's just put a few antibiotic drops onto the wound and injected her with some antibiotics just in case she's suffering any form of bacterial infection. And those drops will stop that wound where the dart went in from getting infected. So she'll be totally safe. Mm. So here's some ticks which were latched onto her. One of the things you have to watch out for when you're working with large mammals, they're surrounded by ticks, either on them or just in the habitat where they live. It's now 25 minutes since went in. 26 minutes now. So we still have plenty of time. Once she is unconscious like this, what are you looking for in terms of a, a general health assessment? So normally we'd do a body condition score mm -hmm. and say whether it's in excellent condition, good condition, poor condition. What would this condition be? This school. is excellent. She, she seems she's strong, yes. powerful girl. Yeah. <laughs> there are some conditions that would normally cause uh, swellings on the underside. She's able to retract her tongue now. Yeah. <laughs> That's a sign that she's waking up slightly. She's now able to retract yeah. her tongue. So when she's retracting the tongue like this, she's fully awake and we need to be careful. Okay. So Margaret's just doused her with water a little bit, basically just to cool her down because they can overheat when they're under anaesthetic because they can't thermoregulate as well as they can when they're awake. So the last thing to happen is that Margaret's going to put in the reversal agent. At the moment she's probably quite conscious, she just is paralysed at the moment, so the reversal agent will reverse the effect of the anaesthetic and she'll be able to move on her way. Based on the previous lion, I'm expecting a slow recovery. Can we get people into the cars? <laughs> I don't want anyone who's not essential out here because it is dangerous. They can wake up much quicker than sometimes. They can be up in 10, 15 minutes. So we've got to get people out of here. OK, <laughs> let's go. Whoa. Whoa. Perhaps the comatose lion's twitching tongue should have warned us. But since the last one took hours to wake, the film crew and I are feeling relaxed. Can we get people into the cars? <laughs> I don't want anyone who's not essential out here because it is dangerous. They can wake up much quicker than sometimes. They can be up in 10, 15 minutes. So we've got to get people out of here. OK, <laughs> let's go. Whoa. Whoa. Well, well, that was pretty amazing. Just stopped my watch now, one minute 52. So it was under one minute. So under a minute after the reversal agent went in, she was able to sprint. <laughs> Lucky for us, she sprinted that way. <laughs> Just everyone scattered. That was, that, that was pretty amazing. She's just there, but she's watching us very closely. <laughs> That'll get the heart racing. I'm amazed how coordinated she is that quickly. That was, that was quite something. There she is. On a final sweep of the region, we find Jane, whom we first collared, standing in the open. Then nearby, we see the rest of the pride, sleeping off a recent meal in the trees. There are few places in Africa where lions do climb trees and this shasha seems to have the greatest number. Why they like climbing here remains a mystery, whether escaping heat or biting flies, or just enjoying the comfortable fig tree itself. One thing's for certain, they do look relaxed up there. Back at a local safari resort, Andy shows me the GPS data they've collected on the collared lion's movements. Yeah, so we got the, the foot lion we first collared down in the south here, and then the second one, which got up under us, is up here. Would she be going off to, to hunt, following, following prey that way? That's possible, or she could be meeting up with the rest of the pride. Um, one of the things that's a bit concerning, you can see they're right down by the edge of the, the game reserve here, yeah. right next to people who are cultivating. So. 
With two new collars in place, Andy Plumtree's team, along with the Uganda Wildlife Authority, have their work cut out for them. Tracking these few remaining big cats will be critical in ensuring the future of the tree-climbing lions of Ishasha. No predator features so prominently in human history as the lion. And nowhere is this more the case than in Uganda, where conflict between lions and cattle farmers has always existed. It's no coincidence that as human populations have exploded, so lion numbers have plummeted, to the extent that the tree-climbing lions of Ishasha can now be counted in the tens rather than the hundreds or thousands as in days gone by. The conservation work that I've been privileged to be a part of for the past few days aims to save these lions from extinction, but also to help the communities develop so that neither the people nor the lions continue to suffer as they are today and to guarantee that lions are as much a part of our future as they are of our past. Since our visit, Daroka, the lioness who surprised us when she woke up early, now has four healthy cubs to care for, increasing the number of lions in Ashasha to 30. In addition, the village we visited, whose cattle corrals were being attacked, has now installed better lighting, and since then, no lions have appeared in the community. Now, more villagers may do the same.